I took transcripts from our last conversations and fed them to ChatGPT and asked it to find convergences in the topics we discussed. And I did it, I did it in, in like this filter approach. I first asked for the top five symbolized in the Pentagon below on the slide that you can see, then the top three symbolized in the triangle, and then the magical one meta theme of the conversations we've been having. And I just want to mention all of them first, and then I would like to have your opinion on them, whether or not you agree with this. But when we look at the Pentagon, number one was critique of hierarchical systems. And I should say that this is not like the like a critique of the patriarchy, but more generally of, well, wealth inequality, the attention economy. Um, pretty much, I think we are all in favor of meritocratic hierarchies, but mm -hmm. we also feel like the hierarchies we see in politics and corporations and, and the internet are not ideal. Then there's the point of the struggle for national and cultural identity, because both you and I, Jan, we talked at length about Germany's struggle since the Third Reich to find some sort of um, national identity. And Brad, you and I, we talked about Canada, which also suffers some sort of identity crisis and is also the place where people like Jordan Peterson and John Verveke, who is the guy who's famous for his definition of the term, the meaning crisis emerged. So there's something there. And indeed, point three of convergent topics is the search for meaning and collective wisdom. Point four, concerns about the influence of media and institutions. And number five, the role of spirituality and personal development. So that those were the top five. When ChatGPT reduced them to three, it was the critique of hierarchical, hierarchical systems. And I'm probably to blame because I talk a lot about what I don't like about the current attention hierarchy. <laughs> then there's the search for collective meaning and identity and the role of personal growth and spiritual development. And then lastly, when it's really supposed to be compressed into one singular meta theme, ChatGPT says that we've been talking about the struggle to reconcile individual and collective identity in a fragmented world. What are your mm. thoughts on that? Maybe start with you, Brad. Um, I mean, that really just boils down the meaning crisis. That that's what the meaning is, is what, what are we, what are we meant to do and how are we meant to do it? And how do we best align ourselves to make the world a better place or, or yeah, I mean, it's, it's kind of the question, like, are we meant to make the world a better place? Like we, we sort of take that as a, as a for granted, but that's almost like a Judeo Christian axiom. It's like, you're here to make the world a better place. Well, I don't know if Nietzsche would agree. Right. So, uh, you know, or maybe, maybe better for mm -hmm. you. So what is it that we are here to do? Um, and I think that we would all agree that we are here to make the world a better place. And then what does that mean? How do we align ourselves? How do we, how do we help form the structures within society that allow for that, uh, which is what our discussions have largely been. But yeah, they, there's even the question of, you know, uh, yeah. Anyway, I agree. It's a, it's a really good kind of layout. Uh, we've obviously talked about other things, but, but this is a good focus. Uh, what is our identity? What are we striving for? Um, and how do we get there? Hmm. I mean, I've, I, I love that um, we're already trying to, f or that you're using these methods to try to figure out the spirit of our conversation or our cross conversations even to, to give us a bit of a, um, help in guiding our, our dialogue towards something that is productive. Um, so in a way, us, it's kind of already practically showing a uh, possible answer <laughs> to the problem we're discussing, like right, the, the by the, in, in trying to form um, synthesis and 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 convergence in our thinking and this dialogue that it has a certain directedness to it, you know, that is trying to counteract this fragmentation that we're talking about. So so we, not only are, are we talking about it, we're also trying to embody the, the a possible solution. Uh, while talking about it and uh, i like that about it it's, it's very meta <laughs> um and at the same time um what i i mean what i notice is um this this topic of individual and collective is interesting to people i think um uh, when we talk about sincerity and authenticity that is connected to that right uh, 
are you um, hope you know, are you are you are you part of the are you a productive part of the of the group and are you giving your your life to that um, or are you seeking you know your uh, personal uh, sacred self uh, your authentic being and and focus on that and trying to that maybe there's a the good life is somewhere in between there right? maybe the, the you know the wise approach is somewhere in between there or, or you have to balance these things out um so i think it's it's uh, definitely connected to the meaning crisis in a in a very important way to to think about identity and this yeah this uh, this uh, push and pull between personal and collective identity um what i wanted to ask you guys is because i know there's a lot of talk about you know what are our values what is our shared value at hierarchy you know how do we attain personal spiritual growth and ideally some sort of maturity right but what i always wonder is what if we three were already at the point of full well not full spiritual development because it's a lifelong journey but let's say us three we share the same value hierarchy all right we're aligned morally and we have this goal as you said brad like we all agree we are here to make the world a better place not to deconstruct it or anything like that. Like this is not about inquiring about the, the nature of reality as much as it is. Okay. We have met, we have shared beliefs. We have shared goals. Now the question is, if that is the case, as, assuming that it's the case, like what, what are we supposed to do? Because individuals only have so much power. And of course we can all try to be, you know, good people in our most local relationships as far as they may span, you know, and for example, Brad, you're a teacher, so, so you have a lot of influence and a lot of responsibility. Um, you, you take care of a, lot of, of a lot of kids' minds, so you're already scaling whatever internal, what is it, wisdom you have accumulated over the years. But maybe for other people, it's not so easy because maybe, you, okay, you're in a personal relationship, maybe you have children, friends, and so on and so forth. But somehow we also want to, we want to help further change towards a better world at scale and for example Yuval Harari who is one of the world's biggest public intellectuals he always says well if you want to do something to improve the world join some kind of organization some kind of institution and that's good advice because institutions are powerful and I asked JetGPT beforehand like what are the major institutions and, and we sort of found four we settled on four number one is political change right you join a party which you hope you believe that it shares your values and, and you become active in your community. And for example, Peterson and his, one of his answers to the meaning crisis is certainly political change through this arc organization, right? Uniting conservatives, conservatives and liberals. And that's great. And then there's institution number two, which is, I would say the private sector, by the way, you could say that education falls either into the state institution because much of our education is state controlled or in the private um, sector. So you could say companies and you could say Peterson, for example, is also doing something here with the Jordan Peterson Academy. That's a way of, mm -hmm. of trying to scale wisdom essentially through a, through a company. And then there's institution number three, which is a religious organization. And in some sense, you know, you could say, Jan, I, I don't think this is, it, it's wrong to say, but you know, um, John, sorry, Paul Vanderclay, he just pointed out that this Peterson sphere, this sub space of Peterson's following online, which is called this little corner is exhibiting church like dynamics, and that mm -hmm. people are relating through online discourse and engagement to each other. They're trying to align on values, they're trying to find meaning. And they also meet offline in these estuary events. So there's some, some some movement towards local organization and maybe through this new medium there's a new church forming possibly right and then lastly there's institution number four which is the media and mm -hmm. if you think in these four buckets or four categories politics business could also be a, a non-profit of course then there's number three religious organization and then the media given that we meet through the media i mean how are we supposed to to leverage this medium to make some change towards a better world. What are your thoughts on that? Mm. I mean, uh, we touched 
on it in our last conversation. Um, there is a chance to empower individuals um, to signal their um, you know accumulated wisdom um, in a way that doesn't necessitate them to be at the top of the attention hierarchy, um, but by kind of joining in, as you say, in a group, I mean, it could be an institution, but um, in some way joining in, in some form of, of collective um, that so shares a common um, school of thought, a common spirit as in terms of what they emphasize, right? People's motivations are different. Um, so you have a certain motivation, you have a certain knowledge about that, certain accumulated wisdom or life experience, and then you find a group. And that, this is where um, our networking capabilities through digital tools um, are very helpful. As we know, you know, the three of us now trying to sh kind of come to a shared spirit uh, and trying to be productive about it. So again, this, what we're just now doing is kind of exemplary of that. And then in, in uh, um, playing your part in that group, which then can collectively also decide how, what the path forward is to influence. Um, I mean, we are very much, our experience or my experience at least um, is very much bound to, um, I guess the, the, the social media now with, uh, with what we're doing here and what I've been doing for the last yeah, half a year or so. And I guess you could say I have some um, influence in, in, through my company in the way that I'm an, act, I'm an agent in the, in the, in the co collective of, you know, um, more or less honorable activity in the uh, corporate sector, right? I mean, there are also values there, more or less, and you can try to adhere more to those values and by, try to be more honorable or honest or less. So there is, again, here I would say, we have all these ways to signal our values and our ideas, not only by our us talking, uh, not only through dialogue, but also through our actions, emotions, and so on. So by just being active and signaling your values um, and, be, and being conscious of those values and your signaling. Um, and then maybe also seeing where you can have the, if you want to have a bigger impact, which route offers you the, the more impact. Um, I think that's a, a wise thing to, to think about and, and reflect on and get feedback on and then adjust your activity. If, if you are very much guided by this ambition to, to um, broaden out and strengthen your signal, but that requires a lot of confidence. And that's something we could also talk about this, uh, like, you know, figuring out, should I, shouldn't I be more humble? Um, mm -hmm. Am I sure that my signal is, is valuable? Um, or um, is this hubris already, right? But that's a different topic. I don't want to derail the discussion. Still, it is something I think we're also, at least um, from what I read about you, Brad, what you, what you, from your writings, um, it's a, it's a point of connection also between the two of us, at least. Yeah, um, I think to, uh, I'll come back to that maybe. But I think to um, address the original question of, to what extent do we use media? Uh, the institution of media as a way to improve the world, I guess. Um, I think the media, particularly social media um, and the democratized version of it that YouTube and perhaps other uh, social media offers us is um, like a fishing net. You're sort of casting out generalized ideas. Um, you're, you're, you're trying to get um, sort of sound bites, like almost YouTube shorts. I think Johannes, you're, you're mm -hmm. focusing more on those now to just kind of get people to, to pay a little bit of attention to the ideas that you're to catch them because they're not, you're not going to get them, uh, with my, like my, you know, multi-page vision of Canada. I'm not just going to put that out on Twitter and people are just going to read it. They're just, they're not, I mean, I had to kind of strong arm the two of you to read it. <laughs> 
So this is your homework. Um, and <laughs> so, it's right, 14, 14 pages, man. <laughs> right, right. And it's not even close to really being fleshed out and done, right? So, so the media, but mm. that's more of a place where you have long conversations and the writing is for me. It's for me to figure out what it is I believe. And the reason I want other people to look at it is to tell me whether I'm crazy or, or whether I'm missing something really big because, you know, you, you, it's hard to edit your own stuff. And you need that input from other people. Um, but if you're not sort of casting out the the highlights of your ideas into YouTube or whatever, either through characters, um, which I find a, a really compelling idea, um, or just yourself, like Jordan Peterson does. He just throws out his ideas. Now, the, the shorts version of Jordan Peterson is not such a he, – he may need to, to, to rethink how he presents himself sort of on Twitter, et cetera. But – Let's not go there, but mm -hmm. but the core of his ideas, the bigger ideas are are um, you know you have to invest a lot of time to to dig into that. So so you know there's there's I think the the real value of the media is to get people to know that you even exist, and once they start to align themselves to your thinking, um, then they'll start to provide you feedback, either positive or or. I mean, negative feedback is not super useful. Constructive feedback, hopefully, um, because none of us, to tie into your humility idea, none of us knows how to fix the world. If we knew how to fix the world, we'd just do it. Um, mm. But but we don't, and I don't know that any single individual ever would. We, by definition, require the well, collective I think, I think that's power. sort of the issue. I, I feel like that's that's one of the issues because, you know, I mean, if we're all aligned, how do we cooperate if we don't know if we don't know how to cooperate you know what i mean mm -hmm. it's like we may be joining jan and i we may be we may be joining the same political party in germany but you know i mean it's like the, the question is basically how can people who meet online and who are morally aligned and goal wise aligned how can they cooperate and how can people who who tune in contribute to that change right yeah. i mean in some sense you could say that these platforms are places where you vote up or vote down content a little bit like in reddit threads I mean, but that's like mm. a very very small way of contributing and also most people just use the like button or subscribe button to get more of what they want and the dislike button to get less of that which they just have seen so it's more of a selfish uh, optimization thing right they, they improve their their own algorithm they also do it at scale but mostly they look for themselves so what i'm basically and maybe we can move on after this, but it's just something that I wanted to share with you. I think what, what I feel like that is really lacking is in this fourth institution, the media, which they have been democratized, but what's lacking is a way for people to know how they can contribute. And indeed, mm. I think, so So that's one thing. So on YouTube, you don't know how to contribute. It's always like this top-down approach. If you like my ideas, you know, please please buy me a coffee on this link or send me money to my bank account via PayPal, basically. And, and that's it. You know, I'm, I'm giving you I'm giving you wisdom for free. Give me a few bucks and, and that's fine. You know, and, and once I hit a certain subscriber count, I'm also going to feed you ads. I'm, I'm providing a caricature, but but you know what I mean? And, and so the, what's missing is the ability to form institutions, basically value based institutions as channels, essentially. I mean, we come here together and we could say that we form a, a broadcasting network. It would just be one mm -hmm. channel, but somehow, you know, we would branch out. Um, we have not really seen much in, in that regard, I think. And that's something that's really missing because people just don't know how to contribute. They don't know how to, they would love to give back. They would love to be part of it. That would also foster a sense of identity, but it's, I would say it's very, very difficult. And, and then just one more thing to mention, it's also that it's also true that imagine us three, well, we're aligned morally, but we're not aligned dialectically because as I said before hitting the recording button, we don't even know how to most effectively have dialogues and trialogues and quadrilogues online. We don't know how to most effectively communicate. So even if you if you had the perfect vision for Canada bread or I had the perfect vision for Germany, we would have to figure out how to essentially market it. Talking about marketing, mm -hmm. what are your thoughts on that? Do you think that's a valid a valid observation? 
Yeah, I mean, the, um, it, uh, again, it reminds me of, of the idea that um, you have so many aspects in that you need to cover to strengthen the the signal to make sure that the signal is worth strengthening. You, um, you need you can't just you know um, as Brad you mentioned you shouldn't be so confident as to think you have it all figured out. So you need to have a way to kind of quality check your your signals. Um, and uh, you there's all these aspects in terms of marketability and tactics and uh, game you know the the gaming of it uh, or the the um, of the of of how to figure out an audience and how to cultivate an audience right and engage them and all of that it's mm -hmm. like a, it could uh, you you need a team basically to do it properly so pe it, it already selects for people that can um that have that have a life that allows that. Let's say they already, you know, their children are already older. They already made enough money through other endeavors. And now they have like, they can commit completely commit themselves to that mission. And like in cases for, like Peters and others, they have uh, potentially, you know, they hire a people or uh, in his case, uh, his daughter, right? Has been very active for him. And just basically I assume full time help with that kind of work um, and, and then you cover a broad set of talents you don't have to be this multi-talented person that can figure it all out you can focus on your strength and together with the the other members of of that group um you you cover hopefully all the necessary talents to actually get the signal out again if it's worthwhile and that's an important factor that you should figure that out i want to say also that um it might be that whoever is watching this video now, if they were in the right group of people and were active there and would work with them, that group of people might be, could be super influential, right? It's a, a, because we elevate each other with, the, with yeah. the right, with the right connections to the right people, we can, I noticed now with, uh, through the last half year, my conversations with you, Johannes, and also in the, in the corner and so on, how it, ele how it, it helps me in clarity of thought and in, in my communication skills. And it, it kind of elevates all of that. So it helps so much to connect with the right people to fulfill your potential in that way. So allowing ourselves to connect with the right people and experiment more with that to, to figure that out and, and discover the potential of your and the power of your, of your ideas and your message through that i think is very should be very exciting to a lot of people if you have the right tools and as you say you actually feel like you have an influence i think something like in reddit reddit ama right ask me anything where people put a question and then some famous people answers them there's more of a connectedness to the to the to the person you know that answers that because you you put a question and maybe it gets upvoted and then the, usually they answer the top four or so and maybe they do it in a video format and maybe they do it even on some tv show or so so suddenly your question or the one that you help voting up is on the stage so i think those tools to to give people a voice even if they're otherwise maybe shy or neurotic or have issues articulating themselves or so i think um those are worthy of exploration um I think we might be able to find some um, example of how it might work uh, with independent media, like independent sort of news media. A lot of these very small people who sort of want to provide an alternative political view or economic view or whatever, um, a lot of times what they do is they sort of just align themselves under a, a logo or something, and they will sort of contribute their piece and they're there themselves they're their own selves but they they have sort of an alignment of okay this logo represents you know conservative media or liberal media or mm -hmm. whatever and then different people who align themselves with those values core values they will just contribute and upload to that that particular um um logo or that that organization um i think at first you couldn't just like i couldn't just mm. join them and say i would like to implement i would like to upload and then i just start uploading for them there would be some there would be some kind of you know uh, content control to ensure that the message aligned and that it met the quality and such of the channel but 
it's very, very independent. Uh, I'm thinking like Rebel Rebel News or something is, a, is, a, is an example. There's a guy in Australia who is his own reporter, but he uses the brand Rebel News, but he, he does his own thing. And as long as he's kind of doing the things you know, and they're, they're more of a, a right-leaning news source. But then there's a guy in Canada, there's a, there's people in the U S there's people in wherever. And, and they, they're very, it's very independent grassroots reporting. Um, and so I think that something like that as a organizational democratized organizational method with, you know, a relatively limited uh, quality control I mean, there would be some, you'd have to have some, right? You couldn't just have somebody come on and they just, just you know, they start screaming about whatever and, and then they brand themselves mm-hmm. as you and, and the rest of the organization. It's like, no, 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 that's not what we want, right? But so then there is, there could be some, and I think, Johannes, you're, you're actually working on that kind of thing with your, with your um, platform. Um, so, I'm but trying I think to YouTube figure it out, could, yeah. Right, but I think, I think, YouTube could even, you could even do that on YouTube. Uh, one of the things I was, I thought about quite a while ago, I guess it would have been in the summer and I never really had a chance to bring it up with you as when we talked about how you wanted to provide more tools for interaction, like not just thumbs up or thumbs down um, or even leave a comment. But I was wondering if it was possible to, I'm not a programmer, um, but I have some, some experience with it, um, to overlay, like put a Google extension so that you could overlay and then collect data on YouTube videos, so people could could uh, use different metrics to rank videos without creating, uh, without having to create the whole platform first. So you could actually test out these things by laying it on a a, a Google extension and then collect that data. And then on a website, the people who are members of of that extension, it could be a paid access, um, then they are able to see the results and and it feeds them information through the through the extension. I'm not exactly certain if such a thing is viable and possible, but it might be a good step. You basically you're basically saying something like, yeah, basically something like a media matrix alignment because we all live in our own subjective echo chambers. And what would be a good step is to align ourselves on you know a a a joint diet of videos mm. true we're not aligned in that sense it's, uh, that's actually a problem right we, we have a very very hard time if not an almost impossible time to align ourselves um, creatively but we're also not very much aligned in terms of content consumption it's like almost we're like we're not living in the same universe at times i mean certainly with some people right mm. and and that gets fortified yeah, so I, I guess you guys agree then that this institution of the media, I mean, it's also just, it's it's still very fresh, right? I mean, democratized um, audiovisual production, YouTube is really only feasible at scale, I don't know, since COVID, basically, when everybody got a webcam and better internet connection, even those, even though yours is still pretty bad, Brad, in Canada. <laughs> you, you I live probably, in the sticks, oh, man. You should get nah, Starlink. I don't like Elon. Yeah. It's a whole different discussion now. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, I don't know if it is because he's like controlling the media. Like he was doing cars and mm-hmm. then he started to do internet infrastructure, which is communication technology. Then he bought mm-hmm. a platform and then he used the platform in order to join a political movement. So it's interesting how he opted for it, It's quite, it's very interesting actually, because if you think about his, his ventures, his missions, they're quasi-religious. I mean, they're science fiction inspired in part, like the SpaceX thing, right? And so mm-hmm. he was met, he managed to unite very talented people around a very utopian, almost utopian goal in, in the private sector. And he made those companies flourish. So he used the corporate route. He said, okay, we have to unite. In order to change the yeah. world as I want it, I have to build companies. And then he realized, okay, companies only go so far in part because they have no military. I think I'm pretty sure if he was American by birth, he he would have been the top candidate or one of the candidates of the Republicans this this election, certainly. Mm-hmm. But he bought the he bought the town square, the digital town square, and he has a massive amount of media influence. So Elon Musk is basically the digital town square now. Uh, he owns it. So we're talking here about democratized 
we're talking about democratized um, media production, but certainly media distribution is not democratized at all. It's fully centralized in the hands of very, very few corporate actors in in the U.S. and in, in China, which is certainly mm. a, an obstacle to us. I'm not saying, and you know that I'm always critical of these platforms and th of these quasi-Soviet-like attention oligarchies, but I think even within the realm of our possibilities, we have not been able to to build protocols, protocols for communication, protocol for protocols for collaboration, for contribution. Like we have not built those protocols yet. I, I think that's the next step. I think that there's a lot of pressure in figuring that out because people are more and more aware of the power of content moderation and um, and the responsibility that uh, ties into that. I mean, Elon Musk basically in doing so and and changing Twitter, kind of the, the character of the content in, in Twitter and on Twitter um, is a clear showcase of how we are at the mercy, basically, of those um, systems and how they are moderated. Um, I personally welcome that um, there's a bit more uh, diversity, I guess, in in the politics behind these uh, platforms, because it seemed before that they were very much left leaning. So um, I don't I don't like that there are politics in them in general, right? But mm -hmm. if there have to be politics in them, then at least uh, it's good that uh, there's a bit of a balance there. Um, I, I would say, but, um, I think it's also hard to people with ambitions for power and influence. Um, you can ha often, it's hard to separate them from a specific political agenda, right? Because they are ambitious, um, and they, and they want to have influence. So usually, um, they, they will have these emotional ties to some a certain perspective that they then, um, then feeds into their activities um, as kind of powerful actors in the attention hierarchy or the power general power games. So, um, so I think uh, um, it's, it would be good if we foster a culture of, of this meta of the, of these more meta values, right? Not, not specific values that tie to some political side, but more this, these meta values of, Let's strive for um, essentially, I guess, um, truth and 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 progress in the spirit of truth or what I wisdom, right? I, I'm I like the term wisdom, um, but but that is uh, um, that becomes I think that's a meta truth that also um, is very core to 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 Christianity, by the way. Um, and I like that um, if we focus on that, on that, um, on these meta values more, uh, instead of these more concrete values of conservative or liberal and so on. Um, just to to pop, in, Elon Musk has basically taken over three of the four institutions that you were mentioning before. Am I waving in slow mo again? Yeah. Anyway, I guess I'm fading out. My bad. Mm. Yep. But 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 he is right. So I'll just listen. No, 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 it's fine. It's yeah. fine. Um, please elaborate. You said um, he's taken over three of the four institutions that I've mentioned. You could even argue that he's taken part, he's taken over part of the fourth, because I know there's a lot of, in this echo chamber, there's a lot of signal, there's a strong signal of some sort of cultural revival of Christianity. But in the, in the, in, among technology enthusiasts, there's much more, I want to say, um, enthusiasm about the singularity and Elon mm. Musk has contributed his fair share to the notion of us living in a computer simulation, which is, by the way, one of the big criticisms, criticisms I would voice um, about the interview between Peterson and Musk, because, you know, Musk believes we live inside of a computer simulation and that si computer simulation was built by AI in the future, which then, you know, simulates us retrospectively. So that's a major theological claim of course so you could even argue he's taking over all four at least in some spaces he's trying to but yeah. what were you going to say yeah. your, your your connection is stable right now so you can elaborate oh good um yeah well i mean if we're talking about how to how to increase our influence and try to establish what we think is right in the world because i i mean i assume that's what he's trying to do like he 
he's like, this is what I believe about the world. And this is what I believe the world should go to. So he's trying to take over, not take over, but certainly heavily influence um, the political, the economic, the religious and the media landscape. Right. And he's so in a way, even though I don't agree with a lot of what he's doing, um, kind of how he's doing it is the archetype of how you would want to do it as well. Though we don't obviously have the, the wealth and power that, that Musk does. So what's, what's a smaller role that we can take that, you know, cause I actually, I, I wouldn't even want to be Musk. Like totally, it, 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 it's abhorrent to me to imagine myself as him. Um, not because I think he's a bad person, just because I don't like being in the public, like not really. Um, this is a kind of a big leap for me to come online and speak online, despite the fact that I teach in front of students. It's, it's a very personal relationship with students. Um, this idea of just sort of throwing my words into the, into the ether is, is not something that I'm naturally comfortable with. Mm -hmm. And yet he, he loves that stuff. He seems to thrive on it. And so his personality is, is designed or perhaps, um, whatever, but it, he's, he's, that's, that's for him. And that's good. We're, we're all different. And, you know, I said to one of my students the other day, they're like, they asked me if I could do anything. Uh, and this is relevant to your last conversation. It's like, I'd be the hermit in the cave that people came to talk to and ask for <laughs> wisdom and advice and go away. That would, that would literally be my favorite place to be that, that, bearded crazy wise man that told you stuff you didn't understand um mm. that's me that's that's what i would like the role i kind of like to play um whereas musk is he wants to be tony stark and, and i mean that's it's like a bit of a tired trope but it's it's close enough analogy to he he loves being famous he loves being the center of attention he loves having his fingers in all the pots isn't there um isn't there this historical i don't know if it's uh, if it's true or not but there's this coupling often between kings and then their consultants who are often theologians right some bishop or so who's kind of has the ear of the king mm -hmm. um so uh, i mean of course um, uh, there's a the bishop also i'm sure you know has a his own you know audience and other ways to to use his signal strength again but it's interesting to think about um being able to whisper ideas into into the ear of someone who then has this character of of of, of attention grabbing you know uh, signal strength again like this uh, he he's he's the person front and center on the stage um and then they have that audience and then they integrate the 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 whispers of before into their thinking into their messaging um I, I thought about that because before I, when I said we're all signaling and uh, there's potential there to collectively form these groups and, um, and then on the avatars and all of that, um, Johannes, you mentioned that, right? With me or with the three of us talking, let's say, uh, Brad, you and I, we, we have this phase now of, of some YouTube interactivity. And then something happens and we're focused on our lives again, you know, no content from us anymore at, at all, let's say. Uh -huh. Still, we talk now and maybe Johannes will kind of have at some point interviews with Peterson or whatever. And then if it, and we might say something now that mm. somehow integrates into his thinking uh -huh. um, and that might be an important part of, of his uh, um, messaging. So um, it's not it doesn't have to be constant. It doesn't have to be broad. Mm. It can be. Um, the right thing that you say at the right time to the right person, and then that um, that creates a life of its own, like a meme, right? Uh, some meme was created by some person in a in a, 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 maybe they only created one meme in their cellar mm -hmm. at some point, but it had maybe cultural significance that meme uh, because it then you know uh, got all that attention and it was per the perfect fit for some political frustration, whatever. Um, and then that person that created that one meme had huge influence and that no one can tie it back to them potentially, mm. right? They can, they can maybe say to their friends, I created it, maybe have their friends believe them or something, but it's, uh, but it's, uh, um, you, you're basically it's, it's saying that, yeah, th this is one of the things remember, Brad, when I said someone like Peterson is essentially a large language model that's been fine tuned to the feedback that he receives from his audience and it, which in part was my explanation of why he went into this hardcore Christian 
you know, direction, not hardcore Christian, but, you know, dressing it, dressing the part anyways. Mm -hmm. um, what just came to mind, Jan, was you're right. Like, if I was the lead, you know, of your media influence, you know, you would be able to, it, by influencing me, you could be influencing my message with, and therefore amplify your own voice through me. I think that's yeah. one approach, certainly. And this is why I also favor some sort of participative participatory democratic media or content creation right i said before i think last time we spoke that i'm frustrated that i cannot contribute in any way to the podcast i'm listening to in germany even though i'm paying for it i'm little i'm literally the producer you know i mean at least money wise because i'm a taxpayer so how how come they they don't ever ask for my opinion i find that quite strange we could be doing that more much more here and i and I would like to see certain, well, you, you mentioned AMAs. That's one thing, but that's always like, okay, I'm going to answer your question because I'm so wise. I have 30,000 followers or a hundred thousand followers, you know, and this is like a goodie for you, but it's never like, I don't know if Peterson asked his audience, which questions to post to Elon Musk, you know what I mean? Or any mm -hmm. journalist for that matter. And that would be very, very interesting. And I, I also yeah, think that sure. you, you, you spoke, you mentioned humility before, you know, who am I to know what the top questions are to ask Elon Musk? You know what I mean? So it's, it, it would be almost well, like in my own interest to listen to the collective, but most people do not yeah. do that. But in a way, like who are, who are you to, to doubt yourself if you are elevated by the trust of other people? Like, right. I mean, you could turn it around. You could say, if we, if, if, if certain people trust a certain pe a person to say, Hey, you, are rep you represent us here. Right. Um, then there's also, uh, it also can, there's some responsibility, uh, from that trust because it also has this, uh, democratic aspect to it. But, um, I that's only to kind of the uh, footnote mostly. I, otherwise, I, I very much agree with the with the idea of you know a guided swarm intelligence. Let's say like uh, there's um, if if the if the the hive mind the swarm the all the, all the distributed experience and ideas and so on. Um, it's kind of almost it's most it's if you try to listen to all of it, it's noise, right? But if you if you find ways to to align, as we said align certain thoughts then it's it's almost like in companies when we uh, in my work when we uh, consult companies there's this idea that the com if the company only knew what it knows it could function way better um because the, the knowledge is distributed but it's not mm. you, you you can't access it properly you can't use it um properly um because you have to I think that ties into your term of this poetic um, uh, yeah. compression, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, you need, uh, um, and there, here's where I think LLMs and, and I can help us a lot. Um, you don't, you shouldn't only trust them, right? I, I like to say that there should be like a second brain, not not the primary brain. Human's brain should be the primary brain, but you can use it as a second brain, as an assistant, to then see these patterns of of shared ideas and knowledge do the translations, um, right? Uh, uh, also between like just the terminology. Um, when Brad saying talking about truth, does he mean the same truth that I talk about or identity and so on? Like, um, so try to find these patterns and then compress them in a way that makes it so they can be markers on the map of common understanding to then anchor our thoughts. And, and, and so we collectively know what we know and then work from there, right? Instead of always having that noise of, of distributed signaling that is hard to cut through if you democratize it too much. So, but that's where technology comes in, I think, because we, um, it allows us tools to work with the noise um, and, and, and as you say, um, compress it and, and use it and find patterns uh, better than we could before. We tried to do it also before, as you say, audience feedback, you know, and so on. But it's very, um, it, ha it, 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 it could never be as done nearly as well as we can do um, this century. Brad, any certainly. thoughts on that? Yeah, certainly. Um, I, I, maybe this goes kind of back to your, your previous conversation and you guys were talking about the um, psycho-spiritual and techno-political aspects of these things. And 
and mm -hmm. the the technology it's not going away i mean unless we nuke ourselves back into the stone age but but let's let's assume con continuity of of technology in some way um that that uh given the so but i think we need to integrate both of those things like we are psycho spiritual and we are um techno political like we we need to exist in both worlds and i think we have uh i find that technology and and institutions political institutions organizations um they are value neutral so they can be used for good or they can be used for evil technology mm -hmm. or or politics um and so uh but it's the psycho spiritual that guides it i kind of i i drew a little graph when I was listening to you guys speak um, that that myth and I account I, I encompass religion or or spirituality within myth um, that it's kind of like the anchor or the rudder and science and art are like the engines of society and those things kind of come together in institutions and organizations and and we use the the mythology the spirituality the groundedness to say nature and where we come from to help us point in the right direction with science because science is amoral like you can you can learn how to turn humans into ant men if you want um the the spirituality and the the mythology says maybe you shouldn't do that um you know or and your art if you just start making art and doing whatever for no reason and no guidance and sure you make these things but but to what purpose right but these are the generative processes that, that move us forward uh, and the technology is how we we share it and we uh, value it in a lot of ways and so so we need to we need to integrate both of these pieces it's not one or the other um, so um, yeah I I think trying to build these tools like YouTube YouTube is basically first generation social media same with Facebook mm -hmm. and even even Twitter, right? These these came out when social media first came out. I think we're ready for social media 2.0, um, and then maybe social media 2.0 helps us lead towards Christ 2.0, uh, whatever that mm. may be. Does that make sense? Like we're we're constantly in a we. So one of the reasons you're so frustrated with the tools is because the tools were they're archaic, like they really are. They were designed in a in a world where the internet was not as pervasive where people didn't have as much technology access. They, they didn't have access to the ability to like videotape themselves everywhere they go 24 seven, um, which isn't necessarily a good thing, but I'm just saying like uh, it was so, so I think we really need but, to re-envision. I, I would interject something. Yeah. I, I, I mean, I agree. And as you all know, I mean, I'm working, I'm involved in a project that aims towards a better platform, but at the same time, I have to say, I'm also frustrated with how the, current tools are being used because as i've said before technically speaking you know it's the first time in human history that we have this kind of freedom of speech even though there's the you know youtube community guidelines and shadow banning and all of that but still as i always say and it's it goes back to socrates you know and it's not meant as like you know an anti-christian thing at all but we have the right to represent god we have the right to play God in front of the camera and call it whatever, you know, a new Greek God or mm -hmm. Germanic God or Christ 2.0, whatever. And nobody's doing basically, except for myself. That's why I'm so critical of it. I, well, I shouldn't say except for myself, because one of the inspirations is also the rap God, you know, the, the, I mean, so mm -hmm. there's like, I, I see this pattern emerging of people aiming for the absolute in certain art forms. And clearly YouTube is not a play or is largely not a place for art or for, you know, audiovisual literature or poetry or mythology, whatever you want to call it. There is the occasional channel, which is trying to do that, but it, it's mostly just um, talk, talk, talk. And I think one of the reasons that I'm proposing this avatar revolution in part also goes back to something you said, Jan, you know, like you could influence me hypothetically. And if I become very big, you know, like maybe, I run with something you said, you know, mm. maybe I will represent you. Maybe I won't because, you know, like hypothetically YouTube channel blows up and I'm like Germany's young international YouTuber, most influential thinker in German in the Anglophone world. And then I'm like the captain. I represent Germany. Like, why would I listen to you? I am the king. 
you know it's like <laughs> there's also no tool to to tap into your collective wisdom no I, I my ego will inflate and you know i will become this <laughs> this rock star and i will just go completely nuts so maybe i'll i'll blow up um in this hypothetical scenario but more importantly i am not even if i were to you know it's like i'm not able to to absorb all this wisdom you know like we were also placing a lot of responsibility on the petersons and musks in the world because they are our avatars like they come up in every in every conversation because they are personifications of values of ideas you know of of mm. behaviors and but we can't first of all we can't edit them or like we have no access we can't send feedback hey hey jordan why don't you change this um, and secondly, they can also not be edited as easily because in part, because they're only getting older, you know, but, but also because mm -hmm. we reject most everything and we forget most everything. Like if you think about memory, it's mostly about forgetting ourselves. And so the avatar is essentially a container, a poetic container for potential values, for potential behaviors, for potential messages. And the beauty of the avatar is also, in some sense, because of its axiomatic role, its predefined role, like in my case, my avatar, you know, the chancellor of the future, that guy has way more authority than I do. And the beauty of this guy is if I democratize him, which is my plan, as some of as you already, I think both of you know this. Um, so basically, if you take this avatar and you can, it can literally speak for you. And it can literally send a message to whomever you want, not in your name, but in the name of a chancellor. And and maybe that's a good way also to pivot to to Brad's vision for Canada and, and how he could possibly influence that. But I'm just saying we humans, and this goes back to humility, we humans are very, very fragile. You know, as you said, Brad, you don't mm -hmm. want to be Musk. I don't know if I want to be Peterson and speak in front of an audience live without having and like i'm more of a writer actually like for me to come online and and talk to you guys this is also a big step you know i, I like it scripted mm. I, I i like it perfect i don't like this live mm. thing i don't like i like sure. writing dialogues yeah. like i love mm. talking to you guys but i would rather do it in private like honestly yeah, yeah. and so I, I, guess, I guess those are some of the points we are very fragile we are emotionally psychologically we are very limited intellectually memory wise and avatars are editable you know they, they they can be democratized you can create infinite variants and so that's sort of the beauty yeah and i i uh, want to latch on to what you said because it connects pretty well i think um the idea of of these gods that we create and uh, peterson and you mentioned before peterson sphere um so i think Peterson also comes up a lot because he's like a marker of a shared identity between us. Right? There's a part of our identity is these are these thoughts and these um, 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 you know um, convictions and so on. So um, Peterson is like a shortcut for us to mark. Hey, here's a point of convergence between us. So people use that a lot to to kind of mark the common identity. And then, and then this, these avatars or these, um, they can be a frame also for this shared identity, um, which, um, which can also um, give meaning, right? Because we are social beings. So that's the, uh, what I mentioned before, um, the, the secret, sacred self, I think, right? This, uh, the thing that, that you can discover within yourself, this authentic self is maybe not searching that and developing that is maybe not um, the only puzzle piece to build meaning in your life. Um, you should also explore the idea of being part of a shared identity, of a collective identity. In the past, it was like a village maybe, and you were the smith there, blacksmith. Um, and that was, you know, that was your, people were expected that of you. That was the role that people gave you. And then you fulfilled the, that role. And by giving your life to that role, um, you then um, had this sincere approach to life, which gave meaning also. Um, so that is also an aspect of finding meaning in your life to kind of give yourself to some role in a, in a collective. Um, because again, we're social beings. So that's, I believe that that's true. 
but it needs to be balanced out. But um, with the with this global approach, that you can find um, a group that where this is balanced out with your temperament and with your authentic self, and you fi can find meaning in collaborating towards that that shared identity that can even be this avatar that you feed into. I think it's very promising to to people, and it ties into also this this idea of national identity. I think because um, both are a, a way, a bit of an arbitrary frame for a shared identity. Um, uh, I mean, the, the, the powerful thing about national identity is that it's always also a collective of shared destiny, right? Because we build the, we build a certain set of rules, uh, and we, we, we might fail or succeed together. Um, that is, that is a certain in, in, in your real life, right? If your country goes to war, your, your real life, your family will be affected by that. So it has this shared destiny aspect to it, which is very powerful to facilitate identity. Um, but, uh, otherwise, uh, apart from that very important aspect, um, it's, it's a bit arbitrary that we kind of decide, okay, we have, we are, we are this nation now, uh, and, and we are supposed to identify with it. And then, um, and then there's this you know, both sides kind of bottom up emergence of or bottom up influence towards the identity, the, the avatar of the nation or whatever, the spirit of the nation, and then this top down influence, um, and then this continuous feedback in both directions. And I think that's how it would work uh, with the with any spirit um, or, or group avatar or um, group identity um similar to to a national identity and then it's interesting how currently the this this problem or the the failure i don't know what how to call it this struggle about national identity i think all around the world we see countries struggling with their national identity in different ways um and it's interesting how that might connect to this meaning crisis and maybe a lack of of group identity um yeah so i don't know brad if you um i guess i'm i'm also trying to connect it to your ideas about canada in that way yeah um i think the the issue with national identity is we have gone through a period of deconstruction um like i think we spent so long before sort of mythologizing and um focusing on just the positives that there was a, a period where um, people came along and said, well, were you really this sort of heroic peacekeeping nation in the case of, of Canada? Um, and there were lots, there was lots of evidence that, that we weren't. Um, and so I think that process is happening sort of across the world in a lot of ways, particularly in places that have migration or, or have, um, um, people coming in, um, because it, it's like, well, how do we integrate these new people? Right. Um, and because maybe our, our old story doesn't fit with the new story, uh, with the new people. So then what's the new story? Um, and it's, as I said, uh, it's really easy to, to, to deconstruct, but it's very, very difficult to construct a new narrative that is inclusive, um, and also inspiring. Um, so I think the, mm. the meaning crisis is largely due to the fact that we don't know what the new story should be. And then you have Peterson and others, which uh, Johannes, you have, you've kind of um, uh, challenged or criticized where he's like, well, we need to go back to Christianity. We need to go back to the quote unquote source. And as you say, the source would actually be paganism. Um, but, but he's saying we need to, we need to find our roots um, and that's true. I, I actually agree with him in the sense that, that we need to find a shared collective root. I don't necessarily agree that Christianity is the only root. It might be one of the roots. Uh, I think it's an important root, but hang on. Sorry. The doggo is demanding attention. Uh, anyway, um, so, so um, this is... This is something that we need to decide. And, you know, the other point that's important to understand is that the idea of nation uh, is a relatively new one historically. Like it's mid, mid 1800s that this sort of national identity became a thing. Um, so maybe it's, I mean, I, I see its value, but maybe it's not a thing going forward. Like maybe it isn't actually a way that we organize ourselves 
um, we we do have a potential to for a global society. Now I'm deeply concerned about the how that hierarchy of structure is laid out and the current people who are in power who are trying to establish control over that i i i have a mm. lot of concerns with like a lot of concerns with but that doesn't mean that a global structure isn't in fact the answer uh, just because the people who are trying to grip it uh happen to be um antithetical to my beliefs on how things should go so that's something to think about too, which is why I mm. sort of focused on a transcendental, like, I mean, you can't find very many people in the world that would say, no, 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 truth is bad. Living honestly is bad and everyone should lie. Like even people who like well, to lie, I think the, wouldn't, wouldn't promote that. Yeah. Well, I think a few things come to mind just to, to sort of corroborate your point there. Yes, the idea of nation states is is relatively young, and but what what see, what seems to have been lost is number one the myth making aspect to it. Like we don't create national stories. I mean, that's something you may see China doing, you know, but but not not Western countries necessarily so much. We don't mm -hmm. do too much myth making about our own history. In Germany, we have the added issue that our history, our recent history, relatively recent history is so dark that it's very difficult for us to identify with our past right right and, and, and they stole a lot of the myth as you mentioned before they they captured a lot of the the traditional myth yeah um, and they ruined myth for us exactly, exactly. They ruined so it and they ruined it's it worse than that it's, it, exactly like it's also hard for us to recover from that because any myth making any any ideal any ambitious ideal for germany is automatically dangerous Associated. right and then yeah. the other thing is we don't longer we no longer join the military so we don't actually defend our country we don't we don't wear the uniform you know there's no it's mandatory military Canada service so we don't i we don't have to like sweat for our country and lastly i would say because of mobility specifically in germany i mean everybody whenever they get a break let's get out of germany let's go to mallorca you know or let's go to spain let's go to greece well, let's, go to, Turkey, part of let's go to egypt thailand <laughs> let's get far away you know there's a, there's a german well, song uh, not really canada <laughs> maybe but there's well, a german no, actually, song called where i where i grew up uh in british columbia um in central british columbia was basically german tourism throughout the 1980s and 90s was like a massive source of revenue because it was right, just wide open. Right. But in the, as in you the general imagination, nature. it's, it's yeah. usually some sunny place. Yeah. It's yeah. usually some sunny place. So there's this current song, I think it's called Toscana Fanboy. So Toscana, Tuscany is a part in Italy. And it's basically the three places are Tuscany, Malibu Beach, or some place in, in the mountains, I think in France. But anyways, my point was that, so we generally don't identify as much with, with the nation anymore. But if we wanted to to restart the engine of collective myth making about ourselves, I think one thing that we agree upon is that this is not something that you want to entrust for profit, you know, profit motive driven media production companies mm. with. Like that's a disaster. You also don't want to entrust the state with it. And so who's left with it and who's left is basically the people. Right. And so, so essentially, we, we are at a point, and I think it's so ironic. I mean, if you come to the conclusion and you accept that it's true, and, we speak, and, and I want to mention truth in a second, um, if you accept this premise, then we are at a point where we have to restart storytelling in order to rekindle you know, the, the fire of, of some sort of collective identity. But it's hard for me to imagine, like myth itself, would myth itself be based on the truth, you know? It's like, what is truth? I mean, truth is, it, it's very subjective, right? Like yeah, Germany has a, like this a, funny <laughs> philosophical tradition of on the sure one hand, is. critiquing reason. Um, and, and on the other hand, saying that at the same time, well, reason has its limits. And then also we all live in our sort of subjective bubble of the world. And that mm. bubble depends much more on what we are capable of admitting to ourselves, you know, than the objective reality out there. I want to say something about truth because it, it kind of connects well with our German roots, uh, the German language and in, in the English language. I like that kind of little thought experiment or idea that um, there seems to be a common root between um, the word true and in German toy. 
So um, the German right. word treu means something like loyal or uh, trustworthy, right? And um, it, it kind of, it still lingers when you say someone is a true friend, right? Or um, so that means uh, um, they are more, it's more about them being trustworthy or an ideal friend. You know, uh, the, the, the friend scale is kind of high on them and not about them being a true friend in terms of uh, um, they are real, <laughs> right? Um, so um, it's interesting to me that there, that I think there was a shift in how we understood truth um, through um, the enlightenment and more materialist and, scient and scientific thinking where, where we felt like true is what maps onto um, scientific the establishable reality um, and in the past it was more about this trustworthy aspect um, in my mind at least right so and I think that maps on to what Peterson also discussed when he discussed about truth so and it's interesting there was this long discussion between Sam Harris and Peterson about the word truth they balked down on that and they I think they both were frustrated with not kind of progressing through the discussion and kind of being stuck on that word and uh, in the second discussion they had Peterson opted for wisdom instead. And uh, I thought that, well, that was interesting also because it's um, basically if uh, if you say something is true in that more, in this more um, original sense, maybe, um, it is it was more about if you act according to that truth, you will be more aligned with reality and hopefully reality will not punish you. <laughs> So, um, so the wise act might not be scientifically or materialistically true. It's more about that's the act that you should trust will not punish you, that reality will not punish you for. Um, and I think uh, uh, I like this connection between truth and trustworthiness. I think it's important to, to think about that. And then it also has implications for the idea of a vision being true or um, a God, you know, one true God. Uh, might not mean that's the one real God. It might mean it's the one God you should put your trust in. Because if you put trust in other gods, uh, reality will, might punish you, right? Um, uh, and that maybe also, uh, you know, is the, the the critique of the idea of creating new gods um, because they, for someone who is a Christian, um, they would assume that any other God uh, will be less trustworthy. Which is where I think um, I think the the marketing piece of that. So I want to just go back to truth a little bit, uh, and then I'll come to that because I think that's a really important point. Um, I think that we the the materialistic the reductionist materialistic view of truth is that something we can detect with our senses or some instrument. Okay, mm -hmm. um, that doesn't work on a on a on a propositional scale where like you know if you um, drink all the time. Um, you know, you're always getting drunk. Uh, your life is probably going to, your, your life's going to not be as good as it could be. Uh, it, it may be, right? But but statistically, and we can sort of measure, but it's not always. And so is it true? It's it's meta true. It's mostly true. Um, and so there are there are fractal, fractal layers of truth. Um, there's the sort of immediate truth, like if I jump off my roof, I'm going to hurt myself. Uh, there's, and so you can measure that like force and all that kind of stuff. Uh, then there's sort of the, the sort of the more abstract truth of you should live this way. These types of behaviors are going to be more conducive to, you know, like I tell my kids, you know, if you do all the work that I give you, you're going to learn more and you're going to get better marks. Uh, that's not always true. There's always the kid. There's always the exception who like shows up 30% of the time, doesn't do anything and aces the test. They just, however they learned it, they learned it on their own. They didn't need to do anything that or very little that I gave them. Um, but most of the time, uh, the kids who don't do the stuff fail. And so, so is that true? When I say you should do your work, uh, if you work hard in life, good things will come to you. It's mostly true, mm -hmm. right? And people would agree with that as a, as a truism, but not necessarily the truth in every instance. So, and then you have things like mythological truths, like, like, um, there's a, there's a source of being, um, the world was created or formed uh, in in these sort of um, there are sort of like hierarchical structures in the universe, and that's that's a large part of what sort of religion tries to break down. Of you know what's the the highest source, and then 
you know, so what are the sub spirits of that and, mm -hmm. and et cetera. And so these things are also true. Like no one would say, uh, anger is not true, but how do you measure anger? How do you, you can sort of see it, but is that person more angry or less angry? Um, how is it that animals can be angry? Uh, so that's what Pajot sort of talks about these spirits or even Peterson talks about spirits of things that are, that are higher order, that are hard to pin down. Uh, but we know they're there and we know they mm -hmm. affect how people interact and how people do things. Mm -hmm. So, um, so truth, we have to understand truth as, as not just propositionally true, but it's bigger than I that. I think we all so agree. Just, yeah. Just, just to add to that. Um, yeah. In terms of the avatar, um, when, and I, I, I agree with, uh, Jan about, uh, calling saying we should create our own gods. Um, it's it's a very idolatrous and uh, conceited, I think, way to think about divine figures um, that that we humans and that's a common thing in material reductionists that we created God. God is in the image of us, and I I used to think like this. I mean, I, I before I knew anything, I used to think like that because it made sense. The the all the gods in our art looked like us, so therefore we created the gods. Um, I think, uh, but but that doesn't mean I disagree with what you're what you're trying to do. Actually, I think what you're trying to do is is great. We are trying to create heroes or saints or or um, icons, saints like also. icons, and that's what a that's what mm, a yeah. saint is versus a sort of a pagan god. If you worship the saint as the the virtue, then you're doing it wrong. If you're worshiping the saint as someone who guides you to the highest thing then you're doing it right. So that's that icon yes, piece. Yes. So we're creating, we want to create icons and not idols or gods. Now, I, I'm just speaking in terms of how religious people can, how, how it can be marketed to more religious people versus non-religious yeah, people. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure I want to market it to religious people because the bias, especially of Christians, and I think Jonathan Pajot, I mean, I had this debate recently, or quasi-debate. There was some discussion going on in on the Bridges of Meaning Discord server in the German corner. And one of the arguments was a quote by Pajot, Christ is the final hero. He, he contains all heroes. He's basically the end of poetry. And I think this is a Christian bias that, which I, I can deconstruct, you know, why it's wrong in a second, but I, I wanna just say, so, so that's one thing about Christ and about pagan gods, we don't know what they are. Like, like speaking, speaking of truth, like they're certainly products of human storytelling because they are encapsulated encoded in human stories. So we know there are words, like we can imagine that they came from aliens or from, you know, some God outside of this universe who, you know, had access to the minds of, of the ancient Greek or whatever, but the truth is that we don't really know where those myths come from. Like we don't, we just don't. But the idea to, to say that we can't create greater personifications of either elements of the psyche or personifications of values, of roles than have ever been created and that they would be so archetypal that they would be quasi gods because they would be uh -huh. meta personalities. Uh -huh. I mean, you have to be very pessimistic about the ability of our poetic ability, especially now where we can sort of channel it and tap into collective poetic ability again. So, so that's just the thing. And about Christ, I mean, I never really understand the, the Christian claim. I mean, it, it just, it's very confusing to me. So if Christ is a poetic personification of the logos, he's essentially an avatar. You know, I know there's the claim that he, this is the historically true Christ and all of that. And he, he was truly the God man, but that's just belief. Like that's, that's not, if it like, it's, it's a belief, it's believed to be true by certain Christians, by right? most Christians, I would say. Right. But again, technically speaking, Christ is very similar to Socrates in that his words were captured. Well, in the case of Socrates, they were captured much much earlier, much sooner after his death. But, but Plato did not give us a historical account of Socrates. Socrates is a fiction. He's an avatar. And Christ, he was 
like as far as I understand, I mean, he was recorded, quote unquote, recorded or re linguistically reconstructed decades later, right? In part yep. centuries later. So he's also this mythologization, this he's he's also the product of of converging avatars. And now to say that, OK, let's let's say Christ is a personification of the word that of the transcendental logos, like Who's to say that we can't approximate the transcendental logos by a collective personification process of the logos in in greater forms or greater form in the future? You know, it's it's sort of a it's a it's sort of a question of poetic optimism or poetic pessimism. Granted that right now we don't have much reason to be poetically optimistic given the products of our you know recent poets you know but i mean that's just maybe mm -hmm. jan you can comment on that and and take it yeah. apart from your angle well um i mean these things i've pondered a lot and i i can say outright that i'm not super interested in the historical jesus as well i think um i'm, I'm interested in the the personification of certain uh, phenomena or metaphysical metaphysical transcendental um ideas um so to me, though, it it hits a limit, and um, at some point, and I think that's also what Peterson says, in terms of how, like it's a almost a definitional thing. Um, if you define God as the highest of highs, basically in terms of our potential attention, uh, in the attention hierarchy, but not only that, um, the the thing that 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 which you can't think any higher of, then anything we might discover as higher by definition would be God again. And it's similar to Jesus Christ, I think, where in, uh, definitionally um, he is the optimal way towards, like the way, the truth, right? The, 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 he's the he's the 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 this transcendental. Um, he, he personifies the, the 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 pathway into the to the towards God, towards kingdom of heaven, um, and and if you discover a better path. Um, then by definition, it would be Jesus Christ again. Mm. That, so that's, I understand that's frustrating, right? I understand that's because um, you, you feel like, okay, at the same time, Christianity tries to nail him down with those narratives and gives him certain attributes and so on. But I, I like to kind of look behind those a little bit because I think they are phenomenological. Um, they are, I, I use the, the, uh, the metaphor with my kids to try to explain the convergence between um, Ahmadiyya Islam and Christianity, um, because the, basically I said, you know, how how about we imagine that there are that both of you try to create a picture of this flower on the table. You have you have a piece of paper and you have color pens, and you try to draw this and you paint this picture of the flower. Those pictures will be different, and they will be flawed in comparison to the real thing. And if you only look at the picture, then you will see you have we'll have issues with it right but it's a it's an it's an approximation it's it's the idea it's it's us trying in our limited ways to to create um, a picture of something that we can hardly grasp um and can hardly capture and that, that's what Kant said with the thing in itself Kant said basically and I agree with him that we can't really um witness pure reality right we can only have this simulation in our consciousness of reality through our faculties and that's the phenomenological level and that's what we can talk about and what we can engage with and uh, god is differently represented on the phenomenological level of different people and some have it as a personal god and some have it as a more narrative god i maybe have it more like a system weird system theoretical concept and and phenomenon and and other you know people are different that way and some people see it as allah and other people see it as god but we're trying to paint the same flower in our limited ways um it's just too hard and um so that's how i would see it and by that with that definition whatever you strive to accomplish is is in my terminology is us striving towards god if you have this high goal um and everything that you, all these um, avatars and so on, are just new ways to access that. But they are valuable. I mean, you know that I think they're valuable because, because people 
have these the language game of of christianity is failing us right so we need to figure out new ways for people to engage with that core truth and yes and i want to say that this core truth i definitely believe in like i believe in the in the in the idea that there is this it, i'm not sure it's objective okay I, I don't really care so much about objective but it is for humanity an intersubjective truth out there that we can discover that um that is the optimal way to play this game of life and 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 we're striving towards that so that is to me um that is to me what we try to talk about when we talk about god and uh, and as i said like uh, you can call it differently you don't have to call it jesus christ you can call it logos or uh, some other thing but any basically platonic ideal of 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 how we should act as an individual to better facilitate our individual and collective um progress towards this ideal this ideal is 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 basically uh, um this uh, this this yeah what what theologians would call jesus christ in my understanding so uh, it's the it's a, it's a platonic ideal of a human being basically right um and it's a platonic ideal of a human being from 2000 years ago which was based on the experience of the previous thousands of years and the collection and condensation of all the myths that came before um, the mm -hmm. the Middle Eastern world from which this sprung uh, was influenced by Buddhism was influenced by China was it you know like there was there was exchange of ideas and and stuff so uh, Zoro Zoroastrianism and Judaism and all like all of it was sort of condensed into this into this one narrative they they said okay let's poetically mm -hmm. recreate all the things that we know and pack it all into one story and then they then they they told that story i think i think uh it's not so much the quote unquote language game of christianity that is failing us i think it is the human institution of the delivery of the language game that is failing us I think the reason there's sort of a return to Christianity is because the we premium. left it. We left it because it was very corrupt. I mean, there's some really sick things that that people who were involved in the organization of the church did to people, uh, particularly children, um, and in any who were not in who didn't have any power to yes. sort of to deal with them to deal with it. That that these these people in the organization, and then the organizations protected those people, and so people just went, "Fuck it." I'm out. And then we wandered in the wilderness of, of atheism and materialist reductionism. And we, we, we found there was no meaning in that desert and we're now returning to, but you know, there, we're not, we're not confident in the, in the organization anymore, you know? Um, yeah. So I, I think what we're looking for, and I think this is actually where I find in the real value in your project. Well. Right, right, because we've now explored these scientific things and say, well, you know, did this man uh, actually die and then resurrect three days later? Like, uh, you know, um, right. and I'm not, I'm not actually even suggesting that such a thing is not possible for the creator of the universe to do. I'm just not certain that that was actually what happened, if that makes sense. Like, I'm not saying it's impossible that such a thing could happen because, yeah. you know. I would suspect that something that could create the entire universe probably could bring you back from the dead. Um, but, but did that actually happen or because it's linked to so many other mythical traditions that death and rebirth, particularly after three days, uh, links to a lot of, um, you know, solar mythology, et cetera, et cetera, that, that it, it probably has a, a mythical truth, um, of the rebirth of the sun, the death and rebirth of the sun, um, that is prevalent through a wide variety of mythical traditions. Um, and, and that's a lot of what Christianity did is, is they brought these mythological traditions, these mythological truths, and they incorporated them into the story. And so some of what we're reading in the story of Christ is the story of a man 
walking around and sharing wisdom. And some of what we're reading is the integration of these older mythologies that are linking it to cosmic events or, or whatever, be it the setting and re rebirth of the sun or whatever. Um, and so because these are, are mixed in ways that we as a modern people don't necessarily understand, um, the, the propositional truths become problematic to us. And the organizations that are presenting this information also don't understand it in a lot of ways. And so they present it. You must believe this because mm -hmm. it's written here and therefore it's the truth. And we're like, really, is it? How, do, how, how does that work exactly? And I think this is one of the values that Peterson particularly, and Pajot um, certainly as well, has brought to um, the scientifically minded in regards to respecting religious and, and mythical tradition is that they are saying, okay, look, uh, there's, there's varying levels of truth. There's fractal, fractal levels of truth. And, and so these things, and, and when you translate and retranslate myth and, and integrate them into new story, then it, it changes. And so it's hard to decode and we need to be careful with it. Um, so we're it's as i always say complex and and multivariate as to why we've lost this meaning um and what the role is and so where i like your project uh johannes is that it it takes away the authoritarian that the the like the catholic church is is not the ideal way to deliver in my opinion and obviously catholics would disagree with me but uh, this idea that you have one man the pope who is sort of the arbiter of how God should be understood and taught. I don't, I don't think that works in our modern society anymore. We are far too literate. We're far too scientifically minded. Um, yeah, but that's but, not the reason why that's, that's not the reason for the death of God. Like the, the reason for the death of the Christian God in, in most minds, I would say in, in advanced countries in the West is not because the Catholic church has become corrupt. It's because I mean, it's a process, it's probably a gradual process, which started like half, what is it? Half a millennium ago, you know, the yeah, Renaissance. the Reformation, so, because so it's, yeah. it's, it's more than the like Reformation, the because phenomenon. the church was corrupt. Like that was, that was where the, the Reformation came from. No, no, no. Even, even before yeah. it, it. No, I don't, I don't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but that's not what I want to explore. Uh, I, I wanted I, to mention something just because I've, I've noted this in, I've noticed this in, in recent um, conversations with both of you, but also a few other people. I just want to really point that out. I recorded a conversation, I think, two days ago or yesterday with with a musician from Turkey. He's based in Istanbul and he's a very creative guy. And we connect, we connected on Discord server, you might have noticed. And, mm -hmm. yeah. and so I asked him about, he, he reacted specifically to my critique of Peterson's call to return to the tradition in Germ as a as a response to Germany's identity crisis, which was sort of implied that the tradition is Christianity. Period, and and John is his name, John C A N. He's he said that that's very off putting because of course he comes from Muslim culture and he's he's a secular yeah. guy and he finds it very strange that you know as many people th this is also one of the current critiques of. Um, Richard David Brecht, for example, German public intellectual, I always mention that the West is sort of confounding a set of universal, you know, moral principles, which can, which go back to Plato through Christianity, back to Plato and beyond, because Plato went to Egypt, he, he had Indian influences and so on and so forth. You know, the idea of a transcendental unity is not unique to the Judeo-Christian worldview. And so... Correct. What's happening, I think, in these conversations, in part because I'm now, you know, um, what is it? I'm a neighbor, like my community is now a neighbor of the Bridges of Meaning community and, and Grim Griswold's community and so on and so forth. It's like we have to play the what is Christianity and how do we deal with it language game in a more favorable manner. And we also all of a sudden start like to brand truths which are just truths or, or views in a much more Christian manner than, than mm -hmm. we have to. And we, we become much more favorable of, of, you know, this, this, well, this return to Christianity than, than we have to, you know what I mean? So it's like, mm -hmm. it's like an, an act of being nice that we're trying to, to, to use more inclusive language towards potentially Christian people in the audience. But ironically, at the same time, we're excluding non-Christian people from the audience, you know, be they I atheists think... or 
just scientifically minded and uh, agnostics um, or people from other cultures because they're also Indians listening, for example, you know, yeah. like uh, they really want to listen at length about how Christ is the ideal personification of the hero archetype of the of, of the indiv- of the archetype of the individual and so on and so forth. Because, I mean, for one, how can it be if, if he's a guy and, you know, there's more than just men in the world, you know, maybe some women feel feel excluded mm. now because how can it be, you know? And, and so I just want to point that out that, you know, this claim of universal truth in this one, for all accounts, let's, let's, let's remain scientific about it for this fictional character who's based on a real person in, in a more extreme manner um, than, than Socrates is also based on a, on a real person like it's i don't i don't think that's the way forward you know like i'm not a left guy who's like you know everything like forget about all religions or or whatever you know that i'm very respectful of christianity and indeed i have previously called this um avatar revolution the olympic logos games you know logos Mm -hmm. so Mm -hmm. i do see a lot of truth in christianity actually you know like a lot of truth but it's like this kind of low resolution meta truth in part um if it's the religion of the word then i think ironically if if it's the religion of the logos if you made the, the logos you know john one one you know my first name is john my middle name is christian christian so it's like you know i take this stuff seriously but if you make that like the, the core tenet of christian truth then and, and it's the religion of the word then you have to open yourself up and you have to admit that Jesus Christ is a culturally limited personification of the word. Same as there are other personifications of the word, like the Egyptian God. Or the uh, Buddha. Yeah. Or Odin, no, that, you know. But yeah. No, that's fair. I, uh, I think um, it goes back to my idea with the um, that I mentioned with the analogy of the picture of the flower, where um, I think um, it, it needs to have this added element of humility to say um, the what we're trying to capture here, we can be confident in. I think, you know, I, I, me as quasi-religious, I'm, I'm not sure what I am, <laughs> but I, uh, let's say religious person um, at this point, I am confident in the, in these, uh, um, in the, I, in the truth of what has been tried to capture through the Trinity. But I, I don't care so much about the name Jesus Christ or the historical figure Jesus Christ. Or um, so that's, you know, I, to me, that is the phenomenological um, color picture of children in a way. And it, it is, has value. I don't mean to, when I say children, I don't mean to, to disrespect. I just say we are the children of God, lim- yes. Human limitation. Yeah, yeah, right, right. right. So it's, it's our, just our limitation. And, uh, and I'm totally fine with, with, um, with I, I enjoy, I mean, I've been with my kids to this um, um, mosque uh, here locally in, in my city. Uh, it's, an, it's an Ahmadiyya mosque. So it's, it's, um, it's a certain um, group of, of Muslims that go there. Um, and they're, you know, they're not re- recognized by most of, 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 of um, Muslims, I think, of the Muslim world. Um, but um, when we talked um, to the person giving us the tour, it was very clear that we were talking about the same thing in, in essence. The essence of it was it seemed very convergent. So um, so I think that's when we, it kind of maybe ties into the national identity topic also. Yes, any identity that is a group identity is exclusionary. And we have to, and that's a problem, right? We have that with race identity now coming up again. We have that with um, national identities, which where people feel, okay, now we're building board, uh, walls again that we tore down already. And we have that with sports teams, um, where that the, they facilitate unity and 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 energy and a common mission and and motivation and and ambition and all of that. But at the same time, it makes it so people get drunk and punch each other outside of the stadium too much. Um, and so it, it is, it's a cause for unification and, 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 and brotherhood and, and sisterhood, right? But it's also a, a cause for conflict and same goes for religious identity. The problem is if you dissolve all of those uh, markers of identity, then nothing. that f- feeds into the meaning crisis at the same time. So we need to, we need to allow ourselves some identity in all of these aspects. That is not only you know sports teams, but it has some more d- deeper connection to our to what we feel is is 
important important about us and then also learn to to find points of convergence with others that allow peace and and collaboration between us so we can have a pluralistic a world with different identities, be it race, be it nationality, again, and, and faith, and, and at the same time, collaborate. I think I, I, I believe that that can be possible. Like maybe I'm naive in that way. But I think that there's a path towards that. I think there's there by believing in God, I believe there's, there's a path that 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 allows us to, to find the optimal way to do justice to both aspects of this. Um, that would be my take on that. I would agree wholeheartedly. Um, that's where the humility and the truth seeking and honest living comes in. Um, if you're honest, you realize you're just a child drawing the flower and the flower is God and somebody else draws it differently or sees it from a different angle. They have yeah. a different take. Uh, I think one of the reasons why we yes. in say the, in say the West um, draw so heavily on Christianity is because it has been such a central core of how we have culturally dealt with reality for a very long time so there are deeply ingrained linguistic and and um cultural um pieces that that make it so that we will speak a certain language um and so i don't know very much about islam so i don't want to use islam as my point of reference because i i could quite frankly be wrong and blasphemously wrong right or buddhism or hinduism yeah, yeah. and and so i'm 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 somewhat aware of those religious traditions and i'm somewhat aware of the broad strokes and and i would be more than happy to listen to somebody and i think this is what we can do in the sense of in this in this, if we use the teams analogy or the sports teams analogy if we are able to cheer for our team but also respect the other team because without them we 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 don't have anything and so yes. if I happen to be a Christian, uh, which, you know, culturally, certainly I am, I'm not a practicing one. Um, and I think, uh, yeah, and you and I, very similar, believe in God, not so sure about all the structure, understand there's a lot of wisdom in in that religion. Yeah. And I am most familiar with that religion. So I, you know, I understand it the best. It's It's sort of my most understood path towards that. Um, but I can sit down and have a conversation with a, a Hindu yeah. and say, talk to me about what God is. And you'll find a lot of similarities and you'll find differences. And And I'm big on comparative mythology, which is like a, why I like to refer to it as a, a mythos or a mythology versus a religion, because religion has connotations of ours is the only truth. Uh, a long time ago, back when I was younger and much less wise, um, you know, I was probably 22, 23. My, my wife was working in a BC in a Muslim school and, um, they had this dinner event. And of course the Muslims separated the men and the women for this dinner event. And, and my wife is like, don't get me fired. I'm like, Oh, okay. Uh, and so she's, like, she's like, don't talk about politics or religion. And of course the first thing they asked me about is religion. And, and so the only thing mm -hmm. that I truly understood about Islam at the time was that Islam was about humility. Uh, as a human towards God, God is so far beyond us that we 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 have we have to submit to His will, um, and so I was much mm. more atheistic at the time, and so they would ask me about stuff, and so I would I would challenge their beliefs by challenging Christianity. Basically, what I said was, how is it that the Creator of infinity of the universe of 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 existence uh, can be bound into a single book? And that's my problem with Christianity is they believe that all truth lies in this one book. Mm -hmm. And of course, I was also referring to the Quran, but I didn't, didn't say that. Right. But they, they understood, they, they understood. And I said, look, it's very, very uh, hubristic to think that everything that is to be known about the infinite creator of the universe beyond infinite even uh, is, is in this little, you know, 600 page book. It's like everything. That's it. Everything you need to know is right in here, uh, right. and and they kind of I knew they understood, but they but I I held that up against their core belief, which is you are not God, you mm -hmm. are you are are subservient to God, um, and so if you think you know everything, then you are placing yourself with God, um, and to me that's that's one of the primary failings of 
hardcore religious people who think they know everything there is to know. And if you don't believe what they believe, then you're wrong. Um, and I think the the step away from religion that we've had socially, this descent into materialist reductionism has actually allowed for more people to step back and understand that religion is a way of knowing. It is the flower drawing that they've made and that somebody else's religion is a different flower drawing and that there's, there's value to be able to observe both. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to, unless uh, Johannes, you want to step up on that, but I'd like to, the, one of the things that, that I wanted to think about going yeah. back to this avatar revolution piece. Um, I was sort of, as I was listening to you guys' conversation uh, yesterday, um, I was kind of laying out avatar archetypes because I think you, you have like the political, the king or the chancellor archetype. Um, there's, then you could also have archetypes for entrepreneurs and CEOs. You could have archetypes for artists and engineers. You could have archetypes for the soldier adventurer, the athlete, the priest or spiritual leader slash teacher, uh, parent. Uh, we, could, we could create avatars for each of these sort of archetypes. But then that led me to the question of what do these archetypes, what do these avatars fight against? Like we also have to create the antipod as well. We have to create the avatars of negativity mm -hmm. and those seem to be easier but in a way they're not you know when i was talking about my vision for canada you you kind of said i want to stay away from you know the the monetary situation and i happen to think that actually that particular thing is one of the primary causes of the dysfunction that we have in our society so right and it's one of the things that that i noticed that marvel uh, superheroes they never really deal with they they fight the gangster they fight the the thief they they might fight the super villain who wants to whatever but they never really deal with the the actual structural problems in society of why there's poverty why there's you know whatever problem and so i i just wanted to kind of throw that out there is mm -hmm. this is another area that we would need to flesh out in building these characters and stories is what are we struggling against we not only need to know what we want to build, but what is it exactly that is causing the roadblocks to achieve those things? And then we have to tell the story of how these avatars overcome that. And I like the way you're talking with the skills that an average human could have. You know what I mean? They don't, they're not transhuman. They're not from another right. planet. They're not yeah. right. Like, so, so this is a, you know, this is a, this is a monumental task, but I think if we can nail it, I, I think, I think it'd be fantastic, but, and which is why we need a lot of minds. Yeah. So just to close the Christianity and yeah, the Christianity topic, I guess, from my side, you know, you, you've used this beautiful image of drawing flowers and yes, you can say that probably Christ, the figure of Christ was so powerful and still is because it's not just one drawing of a flower, but it, it, they stacked up different flowers that we have mm -hmm. had accumulated. One, well, some people see Prometheus in Christ, right? He died mm -hmm. for humanity. And before that, he gave him a gift, this fire. What is it? Consciousness, maybe, whatever. Mm -hmm. And others see Dionysus, you know, the dying and rising God. Uh, so so there, there is this process. And I think the message of Christianity or any religion of the book, this is also a bit her heretical, is the book and what is the book what is the book it's it's a product of a collective poetic and philosophical and intellectual and cultural process right and so ultimately mm -hmm. if you say our myth making has grown stale and we don't know who we are anymore let's try to you know recover our identities by looking for them in ancient scrolls or whatever like really i think the message here is we have to restart this process. We have to restart this process of re-amalgamating and reintegrating historical mythological figures, historical people as well into new quote unquote avatars who would basically just be children of them, right? And so the, the irony is that even if some of these avatars or maybe the totality of the avatars would outshine, you know, individual avatars who came before, they would still be just a family that emerged out of them. So it's all connected. There's not necessarily a break. It's just a continuation of this incredible collective poetic process. And with regards to a question of what these heroes 
because you're right like i'm not creating i'm not really creating gods either um i'm just creating people who are so principled and con convinced in you know their their divine mission because i mean it's it's easy to write that it's it's very difficult to enact that especially enact it on a on an everyday basis so it's, it's much easier to sketch out a few heroic acts or speeches than actually be that in in, in that sense they are all also transcendental they transcend our ability probably to incarnate mm. them and yeah. so what are they up against and, and i think intuitively you would say you would create something like a christ and antichrist you would create angels and devils and i don't know if that's the right approach honestly I mean, in part, yes, but I also think that really what they're up against is us. Like we are, in some sort, in some sense, the the obstacle to to progress. If if you think about, like one of the one of the early questions of this conversation was, was, what should we be doing? You know, what's the path forward? And what's what's missing? One of the biggest obstacles to our own self overcoming and to to our assuming the role of the hero is that we don't know what the hero would be doing i mean that's sort of the idea of creating these 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 stars that could guide us through the darkness of our you know and i guess that's the answer the answer is is you know you could be called you could be we could be creating a better version of elon musk in the context of twitter and that would sort of be you know a what is it a social media king archetype you could say we could be creating, mm -hmm. I recently wondered, you know, there are these responses to horrible events, like, for example, a terrorist attack in Germany. And you wonder, well, what is the ideal answer that isn't the one which is completely limited by the chancellor's profile, but a message that is both, both from the heart and it's wise and it's courageous mm -hmm. and it's emotional. And you know it's inspiring, and it, and it makes you cry. There's like this cathar this catharsis element to it, where perhaps it also reduces the accruing of anger and rage among the German population. Perhaps it also is an is a way to invite those who are on the other side, because in last terrorist attack in Germany was a Syrian guy who who attacked people during a peaceful celebration of a. Of, I think it was the the city, the annual city fest, and I think so, yeah. and so and so that kind of thing. Essentially, they would just be speaking for us or for our ideals to people in general or to specific people without the limitations that we all suffer, right? Yeah, I mean, um, I, I I also I like the idea of of um, the this spirit idea. I mean, uh, um, and that they are kind of um, a frame to hold and give form to the spirit of certain, you know, ideas. Again, schools of thought. That's my terminology here. Um, I think that's what I th it kind of connects well with Pajot's way of thinking, where um, there's a, sp or also I think Berbeki, right? We have a, this conversation has a spirit um, already. And uh, and that spirit is a kind of and and uh, Joshua Bach would talk about that as well. It's a it's a consciousness or it's a mind, an agent that spans multiple brains. And um, <clears throat> that idea of this shared agent is, I mean, that's already as we keep saying, that's already out there. It's, that's what's happening continuously. That's also the the nation has a spirit, right? And Pajot would say. That if you if there's a war between two nations, let's say Second World War, and um, some attack happens on some front, and then uh, soldiers die, and then the message goes to Berlin that there, something happened there, and and a lot of men fell. It's, he he used the analogy of cutting off a finger and the signal going to the brain, similar to the message going to Berlin. And then from there, it causes other, you know, it, the information goes there and then causes other signals again and, and reactions to that and so on. So he's talking about this body, this shared body of, of, um, of people um, as kind of agents. And it's interesting to think about all these multi-level agents um, that influence each other and are at war with each other and conflict and, and maybe harmonize and so on. And I would, 
I would even I would also want to mention that also the atheistic and and scientific thinking, um, to me they can be part of the team in a way, if they, um, if they strive for for something, if they strive for the betterment of 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 our situation, to me they're already, I would translate into a belief of God. Um, they even they you know even if they themselves would say no you know I I. I I don't like that you even mention uh, that you kind of make that connection. I understand that also, but at the same time, the, uh, as long as you, if you are like an, if you act out nihilism, in just in just not caring about anything, then I would say get a grip, right? <laughs> but uh, if you if you are striving towards something with us, with the rest of us, then um, then we're on the same team. We just need to figure out what exactly we actually should strive for and how to strive for it. And that's again, like the potential is there to figure that out way better than we are. And I think there's also in human nature, there's also this, this motivation to actually do it. I mean, yes, there's layers of bullshit and layers of corruption and layers of evil doing and, and we should maybe personify those bad aspects also and have those be dragons that our heroes overcome. But um, that's an, that is an interesting thought, I think. But at the same time, um, Mainly, I'm interested in cultivating this, what we notice with the meaning crisis, that there's something lacking, and then we have this urge and and the hunger, and reality doesn't give us the way, a way properly to 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 channel that that energy somehow. So if we give people more ways to channel that productively, um, you know the sky's the limit. Yeah, I think um. I, I think leaving it open for, for all forms of thought is critical. Like I think the atheists add a, a huge um, reality check because you can get lost in the, in the spirituality and the, the, what do they call it? The woo woo um, aspect of, mm. of religion, you know, and I, th I think those who find religion through psychedelics, they, they really need that atheistic anchor in some ways because it's like, okay, you're, you're making these claims, you're talking about this and, and how do we know that's not just a chemical reaction in your brain to cause you to hallucinate X, Y, or Z. And, and there may be something to those, those uh, pathways, uh, but they're forced to find a way to articulate it in a manner that those who haven't gone through that uh, can understand it. Um, and so it's a good, it's a good check or balance. Um, and in, in the same way that other religious understandings are, are um, checking, you know, how you perceive uh, what goes on. Um, I, I agree with you fundamentally that, that the avatar should um, focus on ideals. Um, but I think to make things compelling or, or one of the ways that we make these stories compelling is to give an adversary or an adversarial spirit as well. And, and I think the, the primary adversarial mm -hmm. spirit of, of our day is the nihilism. It's, it's exactly what you've, what you've kind of pointed out, but all, and, and, or maybe it's, no. it's one of the, it's one of the most powerful spirits that is, holding us back is stopping us from uh, and even the nihilism of who am i to change the world right so i might as well not bother right and and i think we all feel that it's like well yeah who am i and what do i know and why should i bother uh, i'm just going to go live in my cave and people can ask me questions if they find me you know um but Hopefully it's they it, won't find me. <laughs> right but but it's 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 a it's yeah and perhaps that's I don't know. I don't know. It's it's an interesting thing that I just thought about. Like, how do we tell these stories in a compelling way? Having an adversary is one of the ways to make something compelling because if you if you avatarize or personalize or personify um, the negative aspect, which I think is is overdone these days, like the Joker movie and and like we we overemphasize the the villain. But the if you want a hero, you know, you still need to. Like the Joker movie, it needs, he needs an adversary and it's not just society because it, it doesn't, it's too nebulous. Uh, he needs Batman and Batman needs, and we need that interplay between right and wrong decision-making or, and right by meaning like uh, appropriate attention that 
is conducive to flourishing uh, and wrong being the types of decisions that impede flourishing um, on a large scale, though that's, we probably need to define those things as well, because it's not, not so clear mm -hmm. to say this is good and this is bad. And I, I think uh, Nietzsche um, is onto something with the beyond good and evil. It's like both of those things are required for, for reality to exist. And so how do we properly align ourselves in a world that, um, that requires evil? Like, like I, I get this a lot from, from atheists and it, it annoys me a lot when they say things like, well, how could, how could a good God allow for evil things to happen in the world? It's like, well, who are you to judge God? And how do you know how reality even works? And isn't it the evil that calls out the good? And it, it, are these things required for each other? I don't know the answer to that, but it, it seems very uh, not humble to assume that, that things that are happening that appear to be bad from an from a, a limited perspective may or may not be evil but then that gets really hard to to process and deal with and and uh but it does seem to be that there's a the tension between these things is what moves us forward it's the energy that moves us forward uh, one of the things i i kind of pointed out just be, i'll finish up on this even, is, even though i still um, don't think that i i, I don't think no, go ahead. Okay. Um, yeah, I think this this good versus evil conflict, which is you know at the heart of the human soul, is is overemphasized as well. Like like that's, I mean, is it really your inner darkness which keeps you from being a better person? You know, certainly there's this Jungian idea that you have to have to explore your inner darkness in in order to to encounter the the light. You know. It's a recurring theme in, in, in many fantasy um, novels and movies as well. But I think we're mostly right now, and I think that's sort of the spirit of the conversation, or at least from my perspective, maybe we can we can do a round to, to close with some final thoughts. I think my final thoughts after this conversation are similar to what I was thinking before, but a little more refined in that I think we're, we're lacking in imagination of how to cooperate also on the individual level, but specifically on the collective level. And we also lack in, in terms of tools. Like we have some tools right now with YouTube and we, we don't have a vision of how we could use it properly right now to, to make an impact. And at the same time, we're missing better tools, which, which take out the pain of having to play visionary with how to use what we're given right now. So I think that there's this. We should place more emphasis on imagining better ways, new protocols, be it for a conversation like this, be it for how to bring people in, for how to allow people to contribute. Obviously, YouTube mm -hmm. comments are one option. It's the most obvious option. And then to build better tools. Yeah, I mean, um, I guess um, I, I think um, I've put a lot of emphasis in our conversations um, in making sure that we have this common that we that we have the same perspective on this idea in terms of the essence of of it right uh, we don't talk about the details so much and how to implement and so on but the the kind of the, what's the motivation behind giving better tools and and better access and giving more um i guess power to the potential of these forming of spirits and the dialogue between them um, or giving the clearer form to the spirits. Again, they are already anyhow everywhere, but um, giving them clearer form and, and, and better ways to have dialogue between them. I think um, to me, it would be interesting next is, uh, I guess, uh, exploring a bit more um, of the core um, or fundamental pillars of the such a system, like you know, more a bit more concretely, like how would that even be? How could that work? Like, um, and uh, um, because I, it's very clear to me that we are, in essence, share the same motivation, right? Um, then and now it's it's interesting to explore how could that be implemented, um, or I just, um, I mean, I, I I'm very interested to see 
to be to be able to test maybe this platform of yours as, as soon as there's some way to have like an early access or so i would recommend also to to iterate on it early right with uh, some users and 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 build on that um and and, and learn from the feedback again because of the <laughs> humility aspect that we mentioned right it's hard to structure yeah, yeah. all of that in advance you have to yeah. otherwise i'm just very happy that because i'm um, I've with the corner with the German corner we talked about the bridges of meaning server I I I'm I cherish those people right I um they the the communication they are they have a certain certain they challenge ideas more in terms of being more disagreeable with with my takes um just they come from different perspectives again often not you know in fundamental things we we have a lot of alignment but again it's 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 interesting for, to me to give out put out these ideas and have them challenged um with with you johannes and also with you brad from our conversation now like the points we touched i feel more of a commonality like we're more brothers in spirit in a way and that is also good you know to have that also to have that to kind of know okay, I'm not crazy with with these perspectives and and and, and there are other people that have a, a different media diet a different uh, life experience but come to very similar conclusions because i need because it's again about this balance of humility and confidence right and i i um, it's good to explore that with you so i'm just appreciative of that chance yeah i would agree with all of that um so maybe one of the concrete things that we can do um is why don't you guys take a stab at what an ideal germany would look like what what is it that the chancellor would make should he be in power what what is it like what what would that look like and then we can bounce those ideas because i think i think if if we like my idea for canada yeah okay it was just it was literally just a i need to throw some stuff at the wall and and get something out there you guys say this is what germany is canada and germany are not the same place but i would imagine that there would be a lot of alignment in what an ideal nation would look like right um and so the more people that take a shot at that and even invite people on the discord servers or even the bridges of meaning discord which i haven't really engaged with yet and maybe i will now that i've started to actually formulate in writing what it is that i think um and maybe i can i can do some things there i'm i'm also sort of trying to write a fictional character it's a bit mythologized and fantasized or like a um it's not based in reality because i'm just starting there um but i'm when i created these sort of archetypes i may just pick one and try and imagine what that might look like or i may even um try and create a canadian prime minister and then mm -hmm. we can have conversations and and i might actually i think you know i mentioned the uh the don cherry guy to you johannes about how uh jordan peterson kind of wear those maybe that's maybe that's the <laughs> the crazy nice. canadian character and so i find a crazy suit and i speak like he did uh canadians will recognize who i'm imitating um as germans and many others recognize who you're imitating and and he had a lot of he had a lot of strong beliefs about what canada is and i could i could take those and and manipulate them and he and he wasn't as uh exclusive or or traditional as as most people interpreted him to be he just said look if you're coming to canada you want you are going to take on canadian values that's why you came here so take on canadian values we sure you can bring yours, but they need to, they need to align with the Canadian values. So if we can establish, or if I can sort of establish what those Canadian values should look like, um, then I can start playing with them with a character and then maybe our characters can interact. That would be cool. <laughs> yeah. So that's kind of my next step. That's what I'm sort of seeing as a practical thing where I can create this. Cause it seems to me you need to start at the high level of what it is you want, right? Otherwise, you're just sort of reacting to things and then, sure, your character kind of grows, but then it's nebulous. It's like, what is it that if I was in power, what would I do? Right? That and, yeah. I, I, I would you be know, excited to see you spearheading that a little bit because I, the text you wrote, um, I felt was, as I wrote to you, I think that was inspired. Um, so so seeing what you what you turn that into, I'm not sure I myself, I'm... I'm 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 more I guess I'm not leaning so much into the poetic of it all. I'm, I I I think it's interesting. I want to be part of it and witnessing it, and maybe you know help be helpful in some way. 
but I'm um, I'm also interested in the the kind of more uh, the system of it, I guess, right? Mm -hmm. How 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 to uh, include the community and and what the what the um, um, the the feedback aspects models of it would look be. like. Yeah, feedback. Yeah. yeah, the feedback models and uh, incentive structures and so on. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think that's that's an advantage of our group. I'm I'm kind of a historical, mytho mythological minded uh, and trained. Like that's where my interest is. So that's the stuff that I read. Like I I literally just bought the Upanishads and mm. uh, and Metamorphoses. So I've got some reading to do. Um, and uh, actually, you mentioned earlier uh, about. Uh, mythological stuff. I found a really great uh, YouTube channel called Story Crow, and he's uh, mm -hmm. he's a uh, a Welsh, I think, or a British um, mythologist or legend. And so he's he's a storyteller. He's trying to be bring back the bard piece. And so he does some expl explanatory videos, but he also like tells the story as a bard would have told the story. So he's trying to bring back these old stories. Um, and so. Uh, the idea of being the storyteller and, and connecting to that old version of what the storyteller is, I think there's I think there's some value in not necessarily mimicking it, but understanding it and then and then seeing how we take that forward. Um, so there there actually is that content out there, um, you know. And, and so and then Johannes has got kind of feet in both worlds. He's the economics guy slash read a lot of philosophy. Uh, I've read some, but I, I wouldn't call myself an expert in philosophy by any means. Mm -hmm. um, and so when you gather people with different strengths and they have an aligned sort of goal, then you get somewhere. If everybody knows the same stuff, then you argue over details, right? Mm -hmm. and, and you're all kind mm -hmm. of trying to put, produce the same stuff. So there's real value, I think, in, in shared expertise and, and everybody has their own role. And that actually yeah. is what moves an organization. It, it ties into what we said earlier, right? That the potential of the, of the. Ideally, we would already have the system that we're trying to build to build the system that we need. Yeah, I just looked up the the YouTube channel you mentioned. Looks promising. Yeah, he, he's he's right. he's pretty cool. Like, yeah. But anyway, awesome. Yeah, yeah. Just final words from my side. Um, just to to give you a very brief glimpse or some sort of teaser for the Donnerstein mission. I mean, it's very simple. He wants to mediatically empower people, period. Like, I think we're entering the age of the fourth institution, if you will, you know, which is decentralized media, which have to be brought into a non engagement based attention hierarchy. Like the problem right now is that that which is at the top is there because that's what's the most engaging. You don't temporarily um, in the moment. It, it's not a good idea. Like. We have to figure out an attention meritocracy and it won't be one. It will be many. It will be many mm -hmm. and it'll be fun. So looking forward to that That's and true. looking forward to our next conversation. Sounds good. Okay. Me too. Thank you. Guys. Awesome.